So our first speaker of the night is Jason Goodman, and he is the founder of UX Ventures and the Unicorn Dojo. Pretty cool. But here are three things that you're not going to find out about Jason online. Number one, he worked as the visiting team bad boy at the Montreal Expos baseball team. <laughs> He successfully fought his rejection to McGill's Masters of Education program, and he convinced them to accept him conditional to getting straight A's in his first term. And in his first job, he stole hundreds of dollars in cookie dough from Felix and Norton cookies to make enormous cookies for his friends. <laughs> you sound like a great friend. Jason, come on up here and share your fuck up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is so exciting. It's great to be here. Thank you, Marsha, for having me. Um, let's get started. I'm sure you're all wondering, who the fuck am I? I'm going to tell you a lot, actually. Too much information is coming your way. So the, the note about me being a visiting team bat boy for the Montreal Expos, that was a dream job for me because my, the first 18 to 20 years of my life was all about baseball. The only thing you could talk to me about was baseball. I thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. That's all I really cared about. Um, my parents fucked up, actually, and didn't let me take a scholarship. Uh, so that's me in the corner, just in case you need the, the proof. <laughs> I've been waiting for years to show someone this that actually be contextual. So that's me in the corner. So what happened was, um, and this will all come together a little bit, but what happened was my sister had a breakdown. Um, and was suffering from hysterical blindness one day, and it was this really messed up moment in my household, and my entire family fell apart, but I seemed to be able to stay grounded and be there for my sister, calm her down, uh, try and just look level with her, and I just realized that I was passionate about a lot more things in baseball and mental health and um, really became top of mind for me and understanding how the mind worked and how it didn't work. And so I switched my focus entirely. Um, I started to study psychology and took that very, very seriously and became particularly passionate and focused on autism because at the time, um, there was talk of epidemic when it came to aut autism. And I just figured like that's a really like messy, hairy problem that maybe I can make a difference in. So my first job uh, after graduating from McGill and doing my bachelor's was just walking an individual with autism from his readaptation center to his home and helping him out there. Um, and then I continued along that career path, became an educator, did my master's, convinced McGill to take me. Uh, my GPA was like two <laughs> because uh, I was stoned most of the time. And then when I wasn't stoned I, and then I did show up, I wasn't listening. I was that guy in the back who was just like with the laser pointer, like pointing at the teacher. That was me. Um, but I graduated. My mom was happy. Um, and <laughs> what next, right? So I, 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 was, I was really passionate. I'll just go back a little bit, actually. I was really passionate about this. I was very happy. Um, I was working in starting all these different pilot programs in education all across Montreal. I loved it. I, I, I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life. But what happened was every time I tried to innovate and do anything different, um, I just got pushed back and I realized that actually I'm not going to be able to innovate and do anything interesting in education long term. I need to get out. I want to build something. I want to make something. I want to stop talking about innovating and do something. So I left Montreal, went to Toronto. Uh, to go to this lovely place. Does anyone recognize this place? It's the Canadian Film Center. Um, it's uh, Norman Jewison who uh, started a film center. Uh, I'm not into film, but they actually had this, they funded this, um, TELUS funded actually, this interactive um, new media kind of uh, incubator at the time. This was like before the DMZ, before Mars and all that. And I was just very, very happy to be there. I felt like, wow, this like, the, you know, they invited me and a bunch of other designers and developers and all these really interesting people to this film center. I was a guy who was an educator in psychology, like studied psychology. I was so happy to be there. I got a dog. That's Farley. I had Farley for 11 years. He passed away six months ago. And I got, so I got a dog. I was very happy. Um, things were going really, really well. 
This is the up part of the story, right? You know it's going to happen. Um, autism was still top of mind. So just to be, give a little bit more context, at this wonderful place, this is actually a converted uh, horse stable. Um, we got to learn from all these different interesting people about design, technology, what's happening. Um, they brought in outside speakers. They brought in people from MIT. They brought in industry people. Um, I was just inspired, and I was still thinking about autism a lot. And I was thinking about families a lot. Because the one thing that I took away from my experience in working with uh, kids on the spectrum was how tricky it was for the families. Um, and just trying to think of products that would maybe um, bring families together and also sort of address some of the challenges with autism. This particular, is anyone familiar with this? How many people are familiar with autism in general? Know a thing or two about it? Oh, amazing. That's amazing. Um, okay, so this is a PEX program where um, it's a picture exchange program that you use with kids um, or young adults and teens and adults. And basically, you exchange a card for something. So if you want a drink, you exchange this card for a drink and then you get a drink. But what I never understood with this PEX program is why is it not, why aren't we using real photos? Why aren't we being literal? Because we know that people with autism like literal. Um, so I was driving home one day and I called a buddy of mine who was in the program and I said, wouldn't it be cool, like is it possible to spell the word mom and see a picture of your mom? Is it possible? Could you right now spell a word on your phone and see a picture of it? Sort of. Like, we're starting to move there now. Um, at the time, not really. And even still, not really. Um, so we thought we might have a seed idea. So we started to prototype this product called LMNOPix. The idea was you use letter blocks and a spelling board. You create all these different uh, words, and you connect your online family photos. It started to look like this. Uh, again, this is a school project. So you spell the word cat, and you see a picture of your cat. It's pretty cool. This boy uh, was the first kid that we play tested with, and he spelled the word shark. He's starting to spell shark, um, but it also shows shark or sharks, plural. This is getting awesome. So hold on one second. I'll show you what it looks Okay, so we, um, this is the first, when we finally finished the prototype, um, this young girl, Julia, spelled the word proud and saw a picture of her holding a picture she drew for her grandmother feeling proud. Right? We were like, this is special. Okay, I better get moving on this. So what happened was we got a little bit of success. It was business time. We're like, yes, this is it. We got something special here. Uh, they gave us some office space, the CFC. We were rocking. Um, we came up with a, a, a model for like, yeah, you're going to upload these photos, you're going to tag them, you're going to share them. It could be any photo. This is going to be amazing. We pitched it. I pitched it for the first time to a company called Zizzle. You, they, you won't find them today. <laughs> <laughs> they were working with a company called Hooked on Phonics. You've probably heard of Hooked on Phonics. They, were, they weren't pleased when the first thing I said to them was, yeah, this is our toy, and by the way, there's no phonics allowed. Because there, there was no phonics in what you saw. Specifically for lots of reasons, we had to bend. So that's actually what they started to make. We started working with their team in Hong Kong, building this thing out. It was real. But then Hooked on Phonics, crap, didn't sell at Walmart. And so Zizzle and Hooked on Phonics got, got caught in this um, dispute, and they returned the patent and product back to us. OK, let's do this again. Fisher Price pitched to them. They didn't like it. Um, but Hasbro at this exact moment, had just got the license from Sesame Street. So we pitched it to Hasbro. And this is where the fuck up begins. We thought achievement unlocked. Like we licensed a toy to Hasbro and Sesame Street. This was the goal on the napkin. Um, how did this jackpot turn into a fuck up? We had such a good product. It is a good product. It remains a good product. I believe in it. But we rushed uh, everything else. We, um, 
We didn't even think about the business model. This is what we had at the time for the business model. We threw a bunch of ideas out there like, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll revenue share, we'll sell our ideas, we'll get royalties. They were giving us like $40,000 just to hold it. So we were like, this is great. Like, this is, this is the lazy man's dream, right? I'm going to give it to Hasbro and then I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna smoke a joint again, except I'm gonna get a check in the mail. And I never have to do anything. They're gonna build it. They're the experts. They have the distribution channels. They had a $3 million marketing budget. They have hundreds of people who are gonna work on this. I'm done. We did it. The other part was we had agents. Um, agents are the ones who got us into the, uh, into the room to talk to the Hasbros and the Sesame Streets of the world. I never looked at the contracts. I didn't care. Let's just go. Let's go. It's fine. We'll give you 10%, 15%, whatever. Um, this is uh, one of the emails we had back and forth. Once we gave it to Hasbro, we were just waiting, waiting, waiting. What's happening? What's happening, guys? Like, are they building it? Are they not building it? Uh, are they testing it? What's going on? We heard nothing. So, and this is part of, this is a snapshot from the contract. Um, basically, it says, if you take the time to read it, that once they enter into a licensing agreement, our agents actually own it. Oops. Uh, now, even though they, they licensed it, they licensed it, not successfully. It doesn't say that you have to successfully license it, just that they have to license it. This caused huge headaches. Partners. I didn't give thought to the partners. The second we came up with this idea, it was a school project. I just said, listen, we're, we're doing this. And I just dragged everybody along with me. Um, my partners were not the right partners. Within a few months, one of them had to be bought out, and then within another few months, we had other issues. It was like waiting for Godot at this point. So we've, we'd handed it off to Hasbro, and we were just waiting, and years went by, years. So what happened? Um, am I okay on time? Good. Guilt. I was the business mind of this idea, and I was lazy. Um, I thought we had a winner and I just didn't think we needed to think about anything else. And I knew that the blame was really on me. Uh, I was the one who was working on contracts. I was the one who didn't think about the business models. Um, I didn't think about the fact that if we had just actually approached them and say, hey, do you guys need help with this? Like, we could do it. We actually had the team to do it. We could have partnered with them and helped them become a software company, a technology company. Hasbro wasn't ready to become a technology company at this point. Um, the shame was deep and real. So I, when, you, when you're working on something that you really believe in and you're so excited about, and then you build it, you prototype it, and then you license it to a company like Hasbro, I told everybody. I told absolutely everybody. Um, my parents, my family, my friends, online, like it, just, it was just, I told everybody. Um, and to have to go back to each and every one of those people, every time they saw me, they were like, oh, the toy, you're the toy guy, what happened? What's going on? I'm like, yeah, no, not, nothing. Nothing's happening. Not only is nothing happening, I have no control over anything. It was like it didn't even exist. I basically, you know, threw it into the ocean. It was gone. Um, I regretted, obviously, a lot of things. Um, but then the depression started to set in because, and I'm going to kind of fast forward here a little bit, the depression led to anger, um, anger at everybody. I started to, instead of internalizing it, I started to get angry at everybody else. The world is against me. Um, this is not a real term. I made it up in preparing the speech, but I started to form a cluster narrative. How many people, when something shitty happens, you start to say, it needs company, right? You're like, it's not just this shitty thing, it's this shitty thing. It's not just that I fucked up, I worked so hard on this thing and I should have been rich and I should have been famous and I should have gotten this product out into market, but also I wanted to become a baseball player and my parents wouldn't let me. And also I had to have back surgery when I was 20 when all my other friends were going off and doing stuff. And also I had to have another back surgery, so I've had two of them now. And also my sister had to break down. And also my brother's now bipolar. And also my uncle just committed suicide. And also, and it's just one big cluster. And it's just your life starts to feel like you're, you're cursed. And that's a dangerous place to be. And you need someone to help you get out of that. Okay, so does the story ever fucking end? Uh, it does, it does, it ends. So first of all, what happened next? What happened next is this guy 
who everyone's familiar with, uh, launched that device. So when we shut down in 2009, uh, a year later, the iPad came out. Digital products for kids took off. It was the biggest thing. Um, and this was part of the cluster narrative I was forming. Like, oh, but look at this luck. We finish, and then all this starts two seconds later. There's a company called Osmo who did something very similar. You may have seen them. Um, they're two ex-Google guys um, started this company, and it's really successful, and it's a great product. It's uh, a little bit older audiences than what we were designing for, but still very similar, as you could see. Our patent still exists. We have a patent holding on to it. Um, so what happened next is I, I started a family. I got fired from every four or five different jobs, one after the other, after the other, after the other, um, just being angry all the time. Um, my kids didn't notice it because I was always happy with them. So that's my son, my two sons, Max and Asher. And then unfortunately what happened was uh, just a few years ago, three years ago to be exact, my father-in-law uh, passed away. My father-in-law represented entrepreneur, like the entrepreneurial spirit. He was, when, I, when I met my wife and met my father-in-law, he told me these amazing stories about how he moved from South Africa. He was a lawyer there. He went to, came to Toronto. He was selling children's books at the harbor front. He was just always trying to come up with different business ideas. And right before he passed away, he finally sort of had his first success. <laughs> After trying and trying and fucking up and fucking up over and over again, um, he revitalized Samuelson, which is a suits company. And I just, with his passing, um, I wanted to honor that. Sorry. So the reason my daughter comes right after is because he passed away when my daughter was, my wife was eight months pregnant. It was a really tough time. So there was so much reflection going on. And all this anger and all this depression and thoughts and feelings I had about how things weren't going my way, everything just came into perspective for me. That I need to, I need to be like my father-in-law. I need to be like Lawrence. And I need to look at what I have. I have everything. I have success. And Lily came out and you know, very quickly decided that I needed to start another venture. Magic Cape is the different version of that same company. So we actually haven't given up yet. But I knew I couldn't start this. I knew this business was to do it today would cost a lot of money. And I had no money. In fact, I was completely broke. Still am. <laughs> but... <laughs> But um, we started an agency, and a design agency, and what we do now is really help entrepreneurs try not to fuck up as much as possible, and we take a very business-driven design approach to everything that we build. But as you can see on the venture side, you know, we're basically building our own little venture fund, and Magic Cape is still there. Nothing's actually happening. It's more just a promise, really, and a way to honor him. Um, but one day, maybe. One day, maybe. Um, and just to end, um, this is a book that I came across um, when I was really, really down. It's a photographer, a young photographer named Dan Eldon, who was, um, he was unfortunately stoned to death when he was taking photographs, but his journal is unbelievable. And uh, it's all these incredible artistic things that he did along the way while he was doing, uh, becoming a photographer. And, you know, he, he sort of lived by that premise of the journey as the destination. And I just want to... Um, share that I really believe that's, that's true. We say it a lot, it's a common phrase, I know we've all heard it, but it's so true. And, and really, thanks to this journey, I do think that I, I do stay in the moment now. And uh, I'm so happy to be here. And as you could see, I did have one nice moment which was really cool, which was uh, before the prototype broke, it lasted way longer than it should, I did have a chance to let my son play with it. And I had this amazing feeling of that, like, you know, if nothing else, all that, you know, gave me this amazing moment with him. And uh, so just starting to see the positive side of things. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Jason, that was such a touching story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And thank you for being so open about what happened and how that journey sort of took you to where you are today. Congratulations on what you're doing now and really the best of luck. I know you're in a much better space to do it now. So let's open it up to some Q&A for Jason. I'm just gonna make one request. When you ask your question, please keep the question itself brief just so we can get through as many as possible. 
All right, and we're gonna have a mic runner come to you. So who wants to kick us off with the first question? Thank you for being so open. That was a great story. Um, Thanks. I wanted to it's understand. A true story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, unbelievable. I wanted to understand a little bit more about the contract situation. You said that the agents became the owners, but I didn't quite understand how that happened and which agents. So if you could elaborate a bit. Yeah. So it's a very old school industry. The toy industry is a very old school industry. So at the time, we when I started to do some research, I was told you got to get an agent. No one's going to just wa let you walk into these companies. So I was like, okay, and I went and talked to some, and they all had, they knew what they were doing. They all had very aggressive contracts. This particular agent was a lawyer as well. So, you know, they were going to take uh, 20 to 25% or whatever, and I said, you know what, that's fine. I'm not greedy. Let's just, let's just go. Uh, and if you're able to close a deal with Hasbro, great. 20% or 80% of something is better than 100% of nothing, right? So, but I didn't read the fine print. Um, and... We had some serious arguments about that because just because you, you know, to me, licensing something means that you license it and there's an actual deal in place. Not that it was licensed for a period of time and then returned back to you, right? That's not really a sale. Like when we see in the, in the in general business, right, if you close a deal and there's commissions, there's an actual deal. It's not a potential deal that almost happened, right? So that was one of the big issues. Um, so a follow-up question to that. Um, since it is such an old-school industry, um, do you think that even if you had known uh, about that in the contract, you would have been able to change it? Or would it have been a situation where they just would have walked away because they don't change anything? I don't think... I think the, the biggest fuck-up was that... Um, so you have to picture it. Like, we were in Liberty Village before it was Liberty Village. Our rent was, like, a 1000 bucks a month. Um, we had toy companies sending us pinball machines. Farley was what, running around. Our day was very chill. Like we were just chilling and all of a sudden like Hasbro's writing us $40,000 checks and we're just happy. So I, just, I wasn't thinking about like what's the angle here or what's the, like how are we gonna make sure this product gets to market? If I would have, I would have realized that, okay, these are not technology companies. I knew it. I mean, I knew that when I went to go pitch to them and they had no idea what I was talking. I would go to New York and go to Toy Fair and talk to companies about developing web-connected toys and they would say to me, we have a website, thank you. <laughs> Literally, like, li over and over again, we have a website, we're good. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking. So there was a huge opportunity there, but I was so busy just sort of, you know, just, I, I had already thought we succeeded. That was the bigger fuck up. Um, when you look back at this now, uh, with 2020 hindsight this year, yeah. um, what would you actually, is there anything you're like, I wish I've done this differently? Is there any like leverage point, tipping point that I wish I've done that differently? I just wish I wouldn't have like devalued myself. Like I, I literally thought that, you know, we were four, three of us really at the time. So one engineer, I was, uh, we had one designer and myself who was more of a UX designer and um, product development person. I just undervalued us. We kept talking about how like, like we don't, like we're just, we, it was a school project. It was a school project. You know, we don't know the toy industry. I wasn't a, I was a, I had, I had a master's in education. I didn't call myself an entrepreneur. I didn't even know what that word was. I didn't think, I didn't call myself a founder, nothing. I, I just thought like, this is just, we have a good idea and let's just get rid of it as fast as possible and cash out as fast as possible. It was really dumb. <laughs> but no, the, the message of like, the other thing is, once it was in their hands, I started to step up, but it was too late. Like I knew that I had to be the one to champion the idea and explain it to everybody. And here's the vision and this is what the future of it is. And, Hey, Leapfrog, I talked to Leapfrog. They didn't, no one wanted to talk to us. But, you know, I just really undervalued myself. You can't undervalue yourself. You can't. Like, even, you know, a lot of these successful people that we show on the screen over and over and over again, like the Steve Jobs of the world and everything, you know, you don't, you have amazing ideas. Your ideas matter. Your thoughts matter. Your ideas matter. 
and no one's going to champion them better than you. So, yeah. So it's a really fantastic story. And um, I just want to rewind a little bit when you talked about how you had been fired from five jobs and then you decided to get back in the saddle. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, more about that process? Yeah, so um, getting a job after this was pretty fucking hard because I, had a, I switched career like domains. So I was an educator who had worked with like kids with autism who was now going to agencies trying to get a job. No one wanted to hire me. Um, and, and I was also just someone who was, I, I didn't really know, uh, I was so angry and there was a lot of things I didn't like about the agency experience. So I just kept opening my mouth a lot and getting fired. So Twist Image, fired, um, worked at Olsen, like a bunch of these other places. One way or another, eventually I was just fired because I would just get angry and blow up and get angry at the whole situation. After my father-in-law passed away, I just, I started to, to reflect a little bit more about, you know, how short life is, um, just take stock of what I have. And I basically asked my wife, I said, listen, like, give me a month. Um, I, I don't, I, at the time I had no money. We were in debt and we're still in debt now, but it was just give me a month to see if I can get something going and I'll also look for jobs at the same time. So it was a very tricky time. I got a consulting, for UX Ventures, I got a $5,000 consulting gig to get it started and just bootstrapped it from there. So it's been three and a half years now. Um, and, you know, but it all comes back to that first opportunity. And then once I got that contract, um, I just said, okay, that bought me another month, right? So, um, but it was, you know, doing it with, with the support of my wife and, and also just, um, the, what I wrote down on the napkin was that people are greater than pixels. So I had a very good, I was grounded. I'm um, looking at Mariam and some of my team members, they know what I'm talking about. Um, we knew that I was starting a company, it was never going to be about that dollar bill. It was never going to be about the big hit, like Elemental Picks kind of was. It was going to be uh, all about culture. And so that, that's kind of, I don't know if that answers your questions, but that's kind of what happened. Perfect. All right, so we're going to cap it there.